I think first one is probably constant progress. I'm looking, this is a marathon, this is not a race, although a marathon can be a race. Uh, I'm looking at continuously growing on every single level as a person. Uh, the other thing is, I would say, perpetual education, which is so paramount in today's world because the, I think the most important skill and magic tool, not even a tool, skill set that you could probably build is the adaptab adaptability to and flexibility to change. Because yeah. the world around us is moving so fast and everything you've come to know as a reality as a truth is quickly changing so you have to at least open yourself to that fact first and foremost and be flexible and be become flexible if you if you're not otherwise you're going to be left behind heroes are an inspiring group of people every one of them from the larger than life comic book heroes you see on the big silver screen the everyday heroes that let us live the privileged lives we do every hero has a story to tell from the doctor saving lives at your local hospital the war veteran down the street who risked his life for our freedom to the police officers and the firefighters who risk their safety to ensure ours every hero is special and every story worth telling but there is one class of heroes that i think is often ignored the entrepreneur the creator the producer the ones who look at the problems in this world and think to themselves you know what i can fix that i can help people i can make a difference and they go out and do exactly that by creating a new product or introducing a new service. Some go on to change the world. Others make a world of difference to their customers. Welcome to The Hero Show. Join us as we pull back the masks on the world's finest heropreneurs and learn the secrets to their powers, their success, and their influence so you can use those secrets to attract more sales, make more money, and experience more freedom in your business. I'm your host, Richard Matthews, and we are on in three, two, one. Hello and welcome back to The Hero Show. My name is Richard Matthews and today I have the pleasure of having Dom Einhorn on the line. Dom, are you there? I'm here. Thanks for having me, Richard. Awesome. Glad to have you here. We're um, here you're coming in from the, uh, the south of France. Is that right? That's correct. Southwest more specifically. I'm a couple hours east of Bordeaux and uh, an hour and a half north of Toulouse. Yeah, I know. We were, uh, we're, my wife and I were talking about um, picking up a, uh, a sailing yacht for our travels in the future. Um, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly because I'm not French, but the uh, manufacturer we're looking at has their factories in La Roche, I believe. La, La Rochelle. La Rochelle. There we go. Yeah. Um, and, beautiful town. Just yeah, a little yeah. bit northeast from here. A beautiful, beautiful town right on the, uh, on the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, which is where we'd have to go if we wanted to actually see them. And I was like, uh, I was looking at uh, tickets, like plane tickets to fly from here to there. And like a straight plane flight to La Rochelle is ridiculously expensive, but you can get them. Um, and we were looking at like, if we fly from here to New York and then from New York to London and then London to Paris and drive to La Rochelle, it takes. Yeah, usually that's probably significantly a, less for sure. Or you might, you might be able to fly straight to Paris and just take the train to La Rochelle because if you've never been to France, one of the great things about France is that you can go even into the smallest town by train. Oh, that'd be cool. uh, and, and it's very easy to do and it's actually a lot less stressful than taking a car yeah yeah and i was like the uh the drive from paris to la rochelle is only like four or five hours um or something like that and i think like the layover is if you were getting if you're going from london to la rochelle or whatever is longer than the drive if you just flew straight yeah, to yeah paris. no doubt no doubt yeah so, but i would recommend i would recommend a train great ex great experience uh you know everybody takes the train in france so it's also very cheap Unlike yes. the U.S., we didn't have the battles between the Rockefellers and the uh, J.P. Morgans, so yeah. we got a, we got a <laughs> nice, uh, you know. Again, you can get from point A to point B very efficiently, very cheaply by train. Yeah, I went to uh, Thailand once. And we got to take the overnight train from Bangkok to Chiang Mai. That was super cool. Um, I think our our kids would love it if we ever got a chance to go out there and do that. Uh, so, anyways, for uh, for our audience that's been following us around in our travels, we're still in South Carolina um, for where you know where we're going around here. Um, and what I wanted to do before we dive in, real quick, Dom, is just go through a brief introduction of who you are and what you've done, so we can uh, get in and start talking about your story. Um, so, Dom is a serial entrepreneur with multiple startups and exits under your belt. Um, created the first online art auction back in 
March of 1996, which was acquired by one of the largest auction sites in the world five months later. Um, you then created PowerClick, which is a digital marketing agency that um, you had 500 plus clients that eventually got merged um, or acquired by a publicly traded company back in 2001 for um, an eight-figure exit for yourself. And today you advise and invest in a wide range of technology startups. So with that sort of brief introduction, Dom, why don't you tell us what it is that you are known for now? Right. What's your business like? Who do you serve and what do you do for them? Sure. Uh, I spent the better part of my adult life in the U.S., on the West Coast in particular, in Los Angeles. And my wife and I, very much like you decided to go into an RV, we decided to move away from a big city into a smaller town where you can actually live and breathe a little bit easier. So in a nutshell, we decided to leave Los Angeles not to go to Paris, but we took a little step back. We spent roughly eight months traveling through France, uh, and we visited, physically visited 54 small to mid towns in France. Uh, we made a private list and uh, didn't have to look too far because the same town was number one on that private list. And that town is called Sarlat, S-A-R-L-A-T in the Southwest of France, for those of you who wanna look it up. It's a medieval town of roughly 9,000 people in the winter and uh, two and a half million tourists in the summer. It's the seventh most visited town in France. Uh, if you walk downtown 200 yards behind me, it's like walking back in the 12th century, nothing has changed. In fact, when they filmed the movie, Joanne of cool. Arc, <laughs> and filmed the movie, Joanne of Arc in town, the only thing that they did is take, they took out the cars. And uh, early COVID, we had uh, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck and Ridley Scott here and uh, they filmed the, the new movie, new Disney movie called The Last Duel, which depending on COVID restrictions is about to hit the big screen in the US. Uh, but they spend a couple of months here as well because it's just the area is known for its pristine beauty. Within a 25 mile radius, you have 1,001 castles. We have the highest density of castles anywhere in the world. Uh, but we wow. came here so, you know, first and foremost for a better quality of life. And uh, lo and behold, uh, two years later, we're now it's roughly about 30 of us going on 50. Uh, we built what is uh, quickly becoming the largest incubator uh, and accelerator in a rural setting in the world. Uh, we're about to expand to over 30,000 square feet of space uh, also during COVID. And when we made that decision, uh, it clearly was before COVID, and our market research back in 2017 indicated that roughly 12% of youngsters were actually looking for a, a better place to live and work, I'd say. So a, having a better report between uh, quality of life and uh, career. Uh, if yeah. you are a young startup entrepreneur, obviously, what some of the key questions you're also asking yourself, assuming you either have raised some money already or you're about to raise money, is how far will that money go? And on that scale, you know, you can live in a place like Salah where we are and pay uh, rent per square foot. That's 30 to 50 times below what you would pay in New York and in London. So you have some fundamental yeah. questions to ask yourself there as well, right? Another advantage, you know, for example, two of my engineers are Panamanian from the country of Panama, uh, one of which has worked with me since 2005. I used to have an office in Panama as well. And they used to commute three and a half hours a day to and from the office. Today, they walk for five minutes, they drop off the kids at school on the way to the office and they pick them up on the way home. So for them, they can't even, they don't even realize what's happening to them because they've never been able to experience anything of the sort. Uh, have four employees who live right across the street. So they just, you know, walk over, cross the street, literally 20 yards and I'm, I'm, I'm at work, same thing at night. And they're just loving yeah. it. They're from uh, Argentina. So we're, again, roughly 30 people today from 18 different countries. And strangely enough, which is rare for tech, for tech uh, startups, uh, we're pre predominantly female versus male, uh, not by design. No one had dictate diversity to us. It just happened by way of doing business. So what is it that you guys actually offer to the young startup entrepreneurs? You guys are a venture capitalist firm? We're not a VC firm, but we are seed stage investors. So we're more, I'm personally more of an angel investor. Uh, but the majority of what we provide are incubation and acceleration services for young technology startups. The easiest way to explain what an incubator does to the layman is uh, you probably have heard of the incubator in a hospital. 
Mm -hmm. The reason why premature babies are put into an incubator is to to ensure survivability. Uh, yeah. That's exactly what we do because a startup at the uh, at the onset after the creation that's when it's the most fragile. A lot of the startups need additional help, resources, and experience by way of accountants, attorneys, digital marketers, uh, engineering talent, human resources, et cetera, et cetera. So we provide that concierge service to them. Uh, and then once they graduate from the incubation stage, which depending on where they are today, would last three to six months on average, the idea is to take them through our acceleration program. And that is purely meant to take something that you know that's at the inception that has an initial proof of concept and make it scalable by way of acquisition customer acquisition marketing and sales and that's really where we're strongest so in that sense we've taken for example some uh digital first businesses like mobile apps from a few thousand downloads to 1.5 2 million downloads interesting so what kind of uh what are sort of your what kind of companies are you interested in in working with? Our core focus is on uh, pure tech plays in uh, AI, AR, VR, fintech, uh, digital media, slowly starting to dabble into agritech because we are in a rural area. Yeah, There's yeah. a lot of, of that talent. Uh, so when I say agritech slash food tech, right? Anything that relates to wasting less food, uh, being able to, you know, grow crops sometimes in a confined environment. So, you know, uh, you know, uh, vertical agriculture concepts, things of that nature, we're also starting to dabble into. Although our forte, uh, our history is, is primarily in the digital media space. Uh, and the digital media space right now, you, you cannot be in that space without touching on AR, VR, because it's being deeply dis disrupted by augmented reality and virtual reality, among others. And then you have this trifecta of three technologies slowly becoming one, 5G, AR, yeah. VR, and AI, right? I don't yeah, think that yeah. three years from now, we're going to be delineating between those technologies the same way when I started in this space, the, in the internet was called the information superhighway. We're not no longer using that term today. The internet didn't exist. And you already see, obviously, some terms that are coming to the forefront, like XR, extended reality, which kind of like encapsulate those three technologies and taking them for granted as one. So for, for the layman who might be watching, can you do a, a very brief, like, what is 5G? What is, you know, VR, um, AR? And, and what is the uh, AI? Just like real, real briefly. Yeah, I think probably the easiest way to explain what's happening is by giving your listeners an idea of what is about to happen okay, and how we are about to be disrupted as human beings. Within the next three, five, 10, 15 years at the most, there will come a time where we as human beings have to ask ourselves some fundamental questions the most important of which is, do we want to be augmented or not? Yeah. What's happening very quickly is this concept of singularity, where human biology and technology are quickly merging and becoming one. At some point in the near future, I know this sounds scary for many, uh, at the same time, once you actually see some early iterations, it's also life-saving, like any technology. It's a double-edged sword. It can save us and it can kill us depending on how we use it. Yeah. But I think what you'll see very rapidly over the next few years is that we will be asked to make that decision as humans. Do we want to remain purely biological or do we agree to be enhanced? For those of you who wear a pacemaker today, you're already wearing technology. You're already wearing a certain degree of AI inside of you. Right? And sometimes that's, life, that's a life-saving, provides a life-saving benefit. But some challenges that we'll have to face, for example, if you look at Netflix, which is obviously a lot of you know Netflix, is Netflix in the lab and other companies at the same time are working on full immersion entertainment, which basically will allow us humans to become a character in the plot. Wow. And that, that plot is not predefined. 
it will evolve depending on our interaction with the characters at play. So that's okay. where you get into like full on VR, AR, and AI all talking to each other at that's once. That's 100% right. So basically, I'm trying to explain to you by way of example of, of the technology, the applicability of the technology, and, and the progress that it will bring about. Yeah, and to, 5G to get, is what to, brings the speed to make that ability happen. Correct, correct. AR and VR, right? Obviously, AR enhances existing reality. VR allows you to actually participate in a, an imaginary world. And what's been holding both of these technologies back, and in particular VR, uh, are bandwidth issues, which we are resolving today. Whereas the yeah, AI yeah. component is purely the algorithm that tells the technology what it is supposed to be doing, right? Depending on where we apply it towards, are we applying it towards the field of entertainment, towards the field of medicine, towards the field of sports? So for example, we're in the pre-incubation stage today, with a company called Ochi, that's O-C-H-Y, French company, uh, husband and wife, former pro athletes. And they decided to launch an AI empowered platform that allows an athlete to upload a video of themselves running. And the AI analyzes all of the connecting points, the posture of the head, the shoulders, the knees, et cetera, to do two things. Number one, enhance the performance and number two, significantly reduce the risk of injury. So you'll see a lot of these technologies and a lot of these applications coming to market that will significantly enhance the way we live. In particular, yeah. you know, having ramifications in the field of medicine, what we'll see in the field of medicine over the next five years, the term that we use internally is health tech, which is short for health technologies. Uh, you've heard of ed tech, educational technologies. The ability to learn will be vastly enhanced. So going back to the AR example, if you show little Amy a book, a flat book with dinosaurs, well, all kids are interested by dinosaurs for some reason, right? So she's going to pay attention. But we've done this, uh, this test you know, with, a, with, with kids. So you take the book, the black flat book, okay, here's the triceratops, et cetera, et cetera. You know, oh, okay, she's paying attention. You know, she's being entertained. And now you're showing her an augmented reality version where you have the flat book, you hold either an iPad or right now a smartphone, which will be disintermediated as well in the near future. And now all of a sudden, the triceratops jumps off the page and goes, hey, Amy, how are you today? My name is Triceratops. Let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Well, you'll see that reaction of that kid. Right? Yeah, it blows that their mind. Oh, it's mind blowing. Full engagement, which is obviously what's missing in today's educational system, where we have the talking heads. You know, we all grew up with the talking heads that, you know, with us. We're falling asleep because the teacher is boring. Right. Here you decide what's engaging for you. And because you are engaged, your ability to learn is multiplied many fold. And that child will never go back to what was before. Yeah. You probably all remember, a lot of you probably remember, myself included, how reticent we were at first when the first Kindles came, or came along. I want to hold a physical book, right? Yeah. Well, to a certain degree, I still like to hold one occasionally. But more and more, I started using you know, the electronic version of the book. 10,000 books in your hand. I remember the times not too far away, I would say 10 years ago, 15 years ago at the most, where I would travel and one of my luggages was full of books because I had to go somewhere, I had to do research papers, I had to do present, et cetera, et cetera. And I was paying 50 bucks for the extra luggage every single time for the airline, right? And today, that would look absolutely absurd, absurd if I did that. I can just have yeah. one Kindle with an endless amount of books on it or whatever device you want to use, your Kobo or whatever it is. So what's what's fascinating to me is like we've seen a lot of what you're talking about being talked about in uh, major motion pictures over the last couple of years. I know um, what is it, Alita Battle Angel? Um, yeah. They talked a lot about the enhancing the human body. Um, with that that whole movie is about uh, um, basically adding bionic pieces to human bodies. Um, and what is it, the uh, Ready Player One was all yep. virtual um, virtual reality like life. Um, and I know that just uh, I've been looking in the last couple of weeks into some of the uh, crypto, um, some of the crypto blockchain currencies or assets that are, are specifically designed as non fungible assets so that digital representations of things can be 
um, can be moved the same way that physical assets can um, and only exist in one place. Um, so it looks like there's a lot of stuff that's really lining up to make some of these realities you're talking about happen sooner rather than later. No question about it. I mean, decentralized finance obviously is growing exponentially in parallel with some of these technologies. Yeah. Because I would actually look at, de de uh, at decentralized finance almost like an augmented reality version of money. Yeah, right? absolutely. What, what does money look once we actually take it to the next level, once we actually remove the friction points and we allow money to, f to move more freely? Uh, you know, in, th in that sense, we're working with a startup called Earth Tones that's about, in my opinion at least, and obviously in the founders as well, to significantly disrupt the music industry, specifically for independent record labels and independent artists who have historically faced a mountain of obstacles when it came to actually negotiating contracts, not have smart contracts, blockchain empowered, yeah. uh, been able to get paid a fair share for their creative work instead of the record labels taking 95 to 97% of the, of the share without necessarily giving them much in return when they're actually relying on the creator to come with the clients and, you know, with the cohort of as an influencer and bring those to the market themselves. So those are some fundamental changes that we'll see. I, I think we should probably shouldn't be looking at these individual uh, technologies as separate because they, they form part of a holistic whole in, in such a way where one basically complements the other. Where if you, for example, start interacting and engaging with augmented content, which very quickly will do within the next six to 18 months, uh, you know, it makes perfect sense that your credit card that just expired shouldn't decline because you actually try to play an augmented game, for example, right? Mm -hmm. That's a friction point that can be removed in the process that has no point of being there in the first place. Uh, decentralized finance for me is absolutely going to explode because it's built upon trust first and foremost. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of people you know, you can love or hate Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency. Uh, I'm kind of neutral when I look at them. It's, uh, it's going to change not a, the world either way. Yeah, Blockchain I'm not a lover, I'm not a hater. But the reason why it's worth uh, $30,000, $40,000 any given day, there's a reason for that. Uh, there's a lot of big money moving into it. A lot of people, a lot of smart people smartening up to the concept that also were uh, somewhat reticent in the, in, in the beginning. Uh, but I think what it will produce is a leap of creativity, a leap in efficiency. And I think that COVID, if there is a silver lining to the COVID situation, I think it is actually accelerating the pace as a result of us humans not having a choice but to embrace those technologies. Yeah, uh, I have older friends, older clients in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, my parents included in their 80s, who would have never touched Zoom, Gmeet, Microsoft Teams, or whatever your favorite flavor is, had it not been for COVID, right? Yeah. That, that's one thing. The second thing is, if the, if the crisis had lasted only a month or two, we would have snapped right back because we're creatures of habit. But as a result, the crisis lasting for so long, for a prolonged period of time that's now touching upon a year, soon, soon longer, we've actually had to rewire our brains. We've actually had to create new habits. And it's a habit of efficiency that, we will, that will carry along for the rest of our lives, including for the older generation. There yeah. are literally billions of people, billions, that before COVID happened had never touched a video conference before that today use them every single day. I cannot tell you how many times, Richard, I have clients, older clients that tell me, I used to fly from New York to LA twice a month to meet my friends, my clients, et cetera, et cetera. I'll never do that again. I just realized it's more efficient. I can be sitting at home in my pajamas, talk to my clients, talk to my investor, et cetera, et cetera, and be more efficient by doing it. Instead yeah, of having yeah. to stand in line in front of TSA, get dressed down twice, having to go back through the metal detector because I had some change in my pocket or whatnot. Yeah, it's one of the one of the things that I've been really fascinated about over this last year is watching the massive I don't I don't have a word for this yet, but like the 
efficientification, right? Everything has been made more efficient. Everything like when you're talking about decentralized finance that makes money more efficient and our augmented communication, like what we're having here with Zoom and other things is making communication more efficient. And um, I was reading the other day, something like um, there, something like 84% of the um, value in any given market is locked up by inefficiencies. Right. And it's things like blockchain technology and 5G and what you're talking about, virtual reality, that's going to unlock a lot of that um, potential. So, yeah. I, and so we work with an amazing woman. Her name is Therese Fessler. She is a chief economist and she works at St. Gallen University as well. And she has a, her own startup uh, called Invested.ch. And basically, what she has proven and what, what basically her life passion is is she wants to resolve global wealth inequality by inclusion into the markets. Because as you know, 20% of uh, the people in this world hold 100% of the equities. Uh, so do you have 80% of non-stockholders, right? And they all are currently not holding a share of anything and they cannot participate in what's been proven as the number one wealth creator in this world. So her lifelong mission is to actually solve global wealth inequality by way of inclusion in the capital markets and making it easier and systematic for people to become shareholders in promising companies. Awesome. That's really cool. So I know this is it's fascinating to talk about all this technology stuff, but I want to go back a little bit and talk a little bit about your origin story and how you got into entrepreneurship in the in the first place, right? We talk on this show about your origin story. Every good comic book hero has an origin story. It's the thing that made them into the hero they are today. Right? And I want to hear that story. Were you born a hero? Were you bit by a radioactive spider that made you want to start your first auction company? Um, or did you, uh, like, how did, how did it, that go for you? How did that transition from, you know, from your early career into becoming an entrepreneur where you are today? How did that happen? Yeah, I, I don't think, I definitely think I wasn't born with it. I was born in a lower middle class family my father was a railway employee. My mom was an amazing pastry chef. Thank, thank God for that. It still is today. And, uh, but I did have a very early action figure mentor, my maternal grandmother. So maternal grandmother was a World War II resistant. And I looked up to her as a kid. I spent a lot of time with her because I had two older siblings, five and six years older. So for me, that was at an early age, it was almost like a separate generation, different generation. Mm -hmm. And I had this amazing time with my grandmother while my parents were working and I spent a ton of time with her. So I think I was shaped at an early age by her. Uh, so she built the grit, the resilience, the discipline in me, uh, telling me her stories, her war stories, which still stick with me now, almost 50 years later. And then I became, she also taught me how to read. Uh, and as a result of that, I read very early. I'd say probably I was three years old when I started reading. Four or five, I was becoming a voracious reader. And I uh, discovered Jules Verne, Jules Verne for the Americans. I discovered my one of the first books I read was uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, uh, yeah. A Voyage to the Center of the Universe, uh, Rocket to the Moon. I'm trying probably badly translating them in English right now because I read them in French. And I realized this is amazing. I mean, talk about action figures. I realized at an early age that you could do anything because here is a guy that 150 years ago described the trip to the moon and actually yeah drew the blueprints of what the rocket ship will look like that will go to the moon in his books, right? So that's like Nox Nostradamus exponential 20, right? That's the way I looked at it. The guy would actually was such a visionary that he predicted what Tesla is doing today and what many other the nan nanotechnology, who would have thought 150 years ago that you can actually send a robot into your bloodstream to destroy diseases? Well, he did, right? So... I think as an entrepreneur, I was very early on, I had this, you know, my mind works in a binary way, where on one side I had this uh, maternal grandmother as, 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 a, as a very strong mentor. On the other side, I realized that if you set your mind to something, you could achieve anything, right? As long as you have that discipline, that grit, and that resilience. So I grew up 
uh, in a household where we also spoke multiple languages at the dinner table uh, about the same topic, addressing each person in a different language, but about the same topic. So you speak to your, your aunt in French, you turn to your grandmother in German or in Alsatian, and you continue on the same topic. And I think the multitasking has stuck with me because today I can have 27 windows open. I know where everything is. Uh, <laughs> but overall, I would probably credit these two elements uh, in terms of shaping, you know, who I am. And it's interesting because uh, those two elements took, took place 45, 50 years ago. And yeah. uh, I'm not so much different today than when I was five years old. I know uh, I have some of the same kind of things. It was uh, books that really set me on my path too. Um, and, it, you know, when I was a kid, it was like the Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad books. And when I got older, I started getting more into, uh, um, into like sci-fi uh, novels and stuff like that. And I remember the first time I read, uh, um, what is it, Ender's Game by um, Orson Scott Card. He wrote that in 1976 or 78. And like, when you read through that story, he's got, he's got a whole bunch of things about um, these things that they called desks. Um, and then the desks were used to interact with the net. And the net had these things where each individual person had an address. And like, you, he was talking 10 or 15 years before it happened about tablets and internet and email addresses. Um, yeah. And I mean, look, if you, if you look at Al Aldous Huxley, right, a Brave New World, and where we're heading right now with CRISPR, with gene editing, uh, you know, with the ability of creating smarter humans, you know, with all the ethical issues, all the philosophical issues that brings about. But again, that was visionary as well, you know. So, you know, some bright minds in the past, including 150 years ago, had that foresight. You know, the, the submarine in, in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, if you compare the blueprints of that submarine that he drew up versus the one we're looking, looking at today, you know, it's 80% identical. Now, the technology yeah. obviously was rudimentary, wasn't really described, but a blueprint itself and the drawing is almost identical to today's submarines. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, and it's, it's amazing how that can impact us. And then we're, we actually see those things become a reality. And I just, one of the things I've been telling people is, uh, you know, for the last 10 or 15 years, we're in the, uh, you know, golden age of business and that, you know, it's really easy to get started now where it wasn't as easy 10 or 15 years ago. And I think going forward, um, it's only like, we're, we're going to enter some sort of a, a technological and health and like, I don't know what you call it, like a Renaissance where everything's going to get easier and faster. And the uh, roaring twenties. Yeah. Back. Except for technology and health and wellness and finance and everything. I think, you know, the next, the next 20 years are going to change the world in ways that the last 20 years would will, will make the last 20 years look like nothing. Yeah, so I think a big mistake that people do, and that's how our minds were constructed, is we tend to think on a linear scale. And progress, especially technological progress, doesn't happen on a linear scale, but on, on a logarithmic scale, yeah. right? So basically, think of a snowball that goes, you know, rolls down the mountain, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's no way of stopping it. That's exactly what we're experiencing today. But to your point of it being so much easier to create a business today than 25 years ago, well, I'm living proof of that. Because if I think back uh, in the 90s, I remember in March, I, I came across my bill in my, from my, my storage room not too long ago. In March of 1998, my monthly bandwidth bill was $8,000 US. And, and I, I used 800 times bandwidth than I use today. So you can see what happened on that yeah. front, right? You know, uh, when I first moved to the U.S., a long distance call was, was, was still call $1.50 per minute, right? Then it became, I remember it was, it was a revolution when it fell below a dollar a minute. Then it was a second revolution when it fell below 50 cents a minute. Eventually it was 10 cents all you can talk per minute. And then eventually it became free. Right. Yeah. And now As we a can video chat live over the Atlantic like it's not even a. And people take that for granted, right? Because you don't necessarily have that hindsight to know where you're coming from. So, for example, we're looking at these devices, you know, uh, smartphones I'm holding in my hand here. When economists calculate GDP, they take into consideration the manufacturing cost of that device, which has become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and the price performance has gone through the roof. Yeah. So none of the performance is actually taken into account. So 
the, the device, initially when we had the first cell phones, they were this large. We had to hold them in a briefcase. The calls would drop all the time and they cost an arm and a leg. Then the technology democratized and slowly demonetized, became cheaper and cheaper, became lighter. Calls would never drop, right? Today, everyone has one. But where we're making a big mistake is that if we're just measuring our progress as humankind on the GDP scale, we're missing the point because yeah. this device has $10 million worth of technology in it today that economists say is worth zero because they don't know how to calculate that and add it to the GDP, right? Yeah. But we can, what is it? It's an encyclopedia, it's a GPS, it is obviously a voice and video communication mechanism. It's a- storage, editing. Anything. Anything. consumption, whatever you want. If, so, so think about it. You can launch your business today on that. You could have never done that 25 years ago. You could have never done that 15 years ago. Yeah. The, down, the downside, there is a slight downside in terms of competitive landscape because it's become so cheap, because technology has so democratized and so demonetized Everyone and their brother and their sister can launch a business today and compete against you. Mm -hmm. So what has changed is you need to change your business model as we've all experienced, for example, with the music industry being disrupted or the movie industry where you don't have an advantage anymore, not even by way of technology, uh, but you have intellectual property, the creativity, the ability to network, to promote, to hustle is becoming more of the differentiator, right? Because if you're running all things equal, you know, let's say you have two competing platforms in whatever space, uh, Uber versus uh, Lyft, how do you really differentiate, right? Uh, because Uber and Lyft today, you know, in most parts, at least in the US, is Pepsi versus Coke. Right. Yeah. So you don't have a core differentiator. You push either button, the right will show up pretty much at the same at, at the same time, at the same cost. So it's becoming ever more difficult to differentiate yourself from the next person if you're a solo provider, or from the next business if you're a corporate entity, uh, and set yourself apart. You know the old uh, the old saying in the advertising world is. Dog bites man is not news, but man bites dog is news, right? So how do you become that man bites dog and actually get the ink, get the coverage? How do you differentiate yourself from the Peloton? <laughs> you have to uh, you have to be in the market of learning how to tell stories because at, at our core, human beings, no matter what we do to enhance and augment, we're always going to be story-born people and learning how to tell and engage with and connect your business with stories, I think is always going to be foundational. I agree. Uh, and before you can actually tell that story, you have to be able to hook and to get the uh, authorization, the, the sign off to actually tell that story because we're, we're flipping through our social media channels. You know, you have two seconds to grab someone. And yeah. if you actually intrigue them enough and they're actually engaged, then they'll give you the right to tell you your story. But sometimes if you don't have that ability, you don't even get the chance, you know, of even saying, telling you your elevator pitch, let alone the long story. <laughs> Absolutely, which which I think I could be wrong here, but this may tie right into our next question here, which is about your superpower, right? And I say all the time, every iconic hero has a superpower, whether that's a fancy flying suit made by genius intellect or the ability to call down thunder from the sky. Heroes have what I call a zone of genius, right? Which is either a skill or a set of skills that you were born with, you developed over time that really help you to do what you do. They set you apart and help you to help your clients slay their fill-ins and come on top in their journeys. Um, and if you really think about it, your superpower is probably the one thing, even if you have a bunch of skills, it's the one skill that sort of ties everything together, the common thread throughout all the things that you have built over your life of experience. With that sort of framing, what do you think your superpower is? Well, number one, I don't know if I really have one, but uh, if I do have one, I certainly wasn't born with it. Uh, I don't think I was born with any superpowers. I don't think most of us are born with superpowers, but we do develop, develop them if we actually hone a specific skill. And if we get like what's Mal people like Malcolm Gladwell in the outlier says 20,000 or 40,000 hours of practice. I think 25 years into my career, professional career, what I've developed is the ability of connecting startups with investors 
and of understanding where they both come from because I started out as a startup entrepreneur and I've slowly morphed into an angel investor over the course of those years. And what I see today is still a huge gap between the two and I call that the expectation gap where what you typically see are entrepreneurs looking for funding that are broadcasting on FM, but unfortunately the investors are listening to AM. There's a yeah. total breakdown in communication. So case in point, in 1993, 1994, I was pitching my first investor and I was very excited because the gentleman had sought me out and I presented him my digital marketing project and I went on for 15, 20 minutes and I see his eyes glaze over. Clearly I was losing him. So I thought maybe it was time for me to be quiet and let him speak, which I did. And then he did the same thing. And my eyes started glazing over when he started with term sheets. Uh, what, what, what money are you raising? Pre-seed, seed, series A, et cetera, et cetera. I was completely lost at that point in time. Yeah. Ultimately, a small deal did happen. I'm not even sure how, regardless of how badly we both communicated. But fast forward 25 years today, Fortunately, we have more people that had successful exits as startup entrepreneurs who are now becoming angel investors. But by and large, you still see uh, a very inefficient process, a lot of friction between the entity seeking investment and the entity providing that investment. And that's you know, what we're looking to solve. And this one of the core reasons why I decided to create Unicorn. But basically bringing in uh, entrepreneurs under our helm, uh, do a lot of mentoring, do a lot of consulting, uh, making sure that term sheet looks right, making sure the executive summaries are done the right way, making sure that it broadcast on AM where the investor is listening to and not on FM. Uh, you know, and I think that's kind of like a skill that I've personally inquired over many, many years of trial and error. And that also brings me to my uh, own definition of uh, failure versus success. Failure, and we all hate failure. I'm not a big fan of failure either. But unless you're willing to live through failure and to actually use failure as a stepping stone to success, you'll never be successful. I've coined my own little phrase when it comes to failure versus success that I call the rule of 36 over one. And basically what it means, it's, it's very empirical. When I moved to the US initially, uh, we were selling websites in a time where selling websites was like, was like selling ice to Eskimos. Nobody knew what a website was. And for the few who had heard of it, they thought they didn't need one. So it took me 36 direct contacts by phone with businesses to sell one website, right? So 35 failures on average, followed by one success, yet I sold that business for seven figures plus, you know, a few, year, a few years later but I was failing 95% of the time. Yeah. Right? That's an important lesson to take home. No matter what it is that you're doing, you know, you have to fail, but you have to be able to, you can measure everything, right? The worst failure is the one that you're not aware of, right? And you're just losing your shirt while failing and, real, and, and thinking you're on the right track. So you have to constantly iterate and you have to always measure what it is that you do. So if you're an e-commerce startup, for example, of course, you're going to measure your spend, what your conversion rate is, what your customer acquisition cost is. Because if you're not, you're going to be spending yourself out of business. Hence the old saying in the advertising industry, right? I know that half of my advertising budget is wasted. I just don't know which half. I think it was David or Jilby that had that saying, <laughs> yeah. but that dates back to the seventies to today. That's no longer the case. So yeah, to sum it up, I think, you know, if I, if I, if I did, do have a superpower, I built it over the last 25 years and it would definitely consist in bridging the gap between startup entrepreneurs looking for capital and investors providing that capital to yeah, them. It, it almost reminds me of your uh, dinners at home when you were a kid speaking six, six different languages, that skill to be able to talk in one language and translate it into another language. Like and not try fly. to offend anyone along the way in that language. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and be able to, you could do the, this the same thing, right? Be able to speak the language of startup entrepreneurs and the language of investors and communicate effectively between those two. You know, what's very interesting about that, I recently, about a year ago, I read a book about uh, people who speak multiple languages. And uh, it's, it's been proven by science now that when you do speak, if you're multilingual, bilingual, trilingual, whatever it may be, and you speak a different language, you adopt a different personality. 
Interesting. And, and that really resonated with me because now I could read the science because, you know, growing up and, you know, in my twenties and thirties, I have often had dreams at night where my mother who doesn't speak a word of English was addressing me in English and I would actually wake up and like, wait a second, mom doesn't speak English. What's going on here. Right. I'm clearly, I'm clearly in a dream. Right. But I do feel different when I speak French, when I speak German, when I speak Spanish, when I speak Alsatian, I do feel like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a different person. I'm expressing myself different, differently. Some people, my wife tells me I have a different posture when I speak in a different language, which I had never yeah. paid attention to because I haven't done any out-of-body experiences yet that have not been able to do that. Yeah, it's, AI will allow us. It's probably why people are uncomfortable learning new languages because you you have to actually create a new self. I agree. That's that definitely it. And obviously that gets harder because the older you get, the more, I want to say encased you are, but the more rigid you become and uh, the more difficult it, uh, it becomes to actually adapt to, to a new language and a new identity because language identities are defined by language. Yeah. Yeah. I tell people all the time that, uh, um, that your thoughts, your ability to think is determined by your understanding of your language. Um, and you know, you, you can't think without words. Um, and so, you know, learning to expand your vocabulary, so to speak, it builds, it increases your ability to think. Um, so I can only imagine that it gets <laughs> increased as you learn more languages. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, you're constantly juggling, you know? So, uh, I mean, I've, fortunately when I, because I'm practicing most all of them on a regular basis and, you know, it helps clearly being in a, in a situation where we have, 18 different nationalities represented here in our office, right? So I'm constantly during the day speaking multiple languages. So that, that helps, but you know, I, I would definitely look at that as a blessing. And for all of you who have uh, young children, you can look this up too. What uh, science has recently proven is that you should, if you if you have a multilingual household and let's say parents speak one language each or two languages each, you should always address the child in your native language and not deviate from that within the first six years of the child. So let's assume you're a household where uh, the father speaks English, the mother speaks Spanish. The father should only speak English for six years straight to that child. The mother should only speak Spanish. If a grandmother is around who speaks yet another language, she should only speak that third language and not deviate because the child creates an emotional bond based on language with that person. And when the child is six years or younger, it has, the child has a hard time making the difference and may mix up the language. But if you wait until six and the child will be aware enough to say, oh, I get it. Dad's American, mom's Colombian, grandma is German right? Then everything is clear and there is no confusion in, child, in, a child's, in a child's brain. That's really fascinating. I know uh, my, my wife is multilingual, but I'm not. Um, and so she, she speaks a couple of different languages and I know she, she'll talk about certain things in different languages with the kids, but it's never like a constant, constant thing. But I know like my, uh, my son picked up uh, sign language really, really well when he was young. He, he spoke like two or 300 words in sign language before he was two years old. Um, and now he's like, he speaks sign language and English and he's learning Spanish and his Spanish class, which, you know, is super cool. It's one of those online, um, online things. And they do full immersion. Like the class is not, there's not a word of English spoken in the class. Yeah. Only way, only way to do it. Right. So we know, we know the, uh, the opposite model just doesn't work. That's why you yeah. have people that take 10 years of uh, French in high school and then in university and they don't speak a word of French because yeah. you're taken out of context. Right. So what, what a lot of forward thinking uh, schools have done in Europe is they've actually taken that same child and just send them and just drop ship them in the foreign country. Fend, fend for yourself when your stomach starts growling, you're going to know very quickly how to say croissant and petit pain when you go to France. You have no choice, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, I know when I was in, a, in high school, we went over and did a, a language camp with the, um, with the Russians. Um, so we went to Moscow and they did like a, it was like a spring, spring break thing for them. And we would go over um, and they basically would uh, assign each of us a class. 
and none of these kids spoke English and none of us spoke Russian. And we were supposed to be teaching. They would give us a whole lesson plan of like, you know, here's what you do every day for the week is you're teaching these kids English. Um, and it was, it was a really interesting thing, but it was a full immersion kind of thing. Cause like, there was no translator available to translate English, English to Russian. You just had to figure it out. Only way to go. Yeah. So if your superpower then is your ability to sort of make that language transition from investor to startup, the flip side of that would be your fatal flaw, right? Just like every Superman has their kryptonite um, or Wonder Woman can't remove her bracelets of victory without going mad, you probably have a flaw that's held you back in your business, something that you have uh, struggled with. For me, it was a couple of things, right? I struggled with perfectionism for a long time that kept me from wanting to ship products because I could always make a few more tweaks here or there. Um, or um, one of the other ones I struggled with is lack of self-care, which for me led to like, letting my clients walk all over me and not having good boundaries set up. Um, but I think more important than sort of what the flaw is in your business is how have you worked to rectify it so that you can continue to grow your business and do what you do today. And hopefully sharing your experience will help our, our audience learn from you there. Without a doubt, impatience. That's always been my biggest flaw still to a certain, to a certain extent is today. I've worked very, very hard on becoming a more patient person. It's still uh, a very happy, heavy kryptonite. <laughs> uh, what I've done instead, I've surrounded myself with people who have that skill, right? That instead of me jumping in and being maybe too hard for certain people, too impatient and being too abrasive, which is a, what I have a tendency of being with certain people in certain circumstances, I built filters between myself and those people with people who are more efficient than that than I am. And what it taught, taught me, uh, because I have that flaw, is to realize that I may have many more flaws and that my team has many more flaws. And that as a result, what I've learned over the years is to build a team consisting of specialists and not generalists. What I usually say that, look, if you're a startup entrepreneur or if you're venturing out to do something with real impact, a nonprofit or organization that has the potential of feeding or feeding a million people or, you know, reforestation projects, you want to have a real impact on the world, you need a team. You have to quickly learn to think beyond yourself. You have to, in a certain, in a certain sense, you have to come to the uh, realization that, you know, that flaw that you may have, yes, you may have, you may be able to improve it in my, in my case, incrementally and be able to live with it, but tell yourself that that should not hurt the team as a whole. Uh, the last piece I need on my puzzle is another me if I have a gaping hole left and right. So I need to fill that puzzle with pieces that neatly interlock and they get along with each other. And that's what I'm working on every day. Yeah, I know. It's one of the, one of the things that um, I've been just struggling with over my life is figuring out, um, you know, you, you hear a lot of conflicting advice in the self-help world and the business growth world of like, you know, do you work on your weaknesses or do you focus only on your strengths? And the older I've become and the more I've learned from really successful people is that the most successful among us completely ignore their weaknesses and they focus only on their strengths and they fill their weaknesses in with people who have those strengths. I could not I could not agree more because it's time more well spent because again, you're basically trying, when you're trying to solve a weakness, you're in essence trying to rewire your brain, which is very difficult and takes a long time. I'm not saying it cannot be done. It definitely can be done. It's been proven over and over. But if you have a lobe in your brain that's already extremely developed, it's easier to further expand that lobe, right? So let's say you're a great musician and you're a horrible business person, right? It's probably my brother. I'm the opposite of him, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm a horrible musician, <laughs> but it's interesting. And we're siblings, right? So it's much easier for him to become an even better musician, which is what he's working on every single day. It's much easier for me to become a better business person rather than trying to play the violin, the piano, or, or, or sing, right? But at the same time, if I were in the music business, I would take care of the business part, he would take care of the music part. And now yeah. we have something we can work with when we each work on a turf where we tend to excel versus trying to focus on our weaknesses. Yeah, I was uh, talking to someone um, a couple of years back and they were talking about um, just the, the mathematics behind that. 
um, where if you have a skill that say you're a 10 in and you have a weakness that is, you know, you're a level one in that weakness, that weak area. Um, if you wanted to double your business and it required doubling your skill in one of these areas, right? If you spend all your time focusing on your weakness, you might be able to get it from a one to a two, right? Where yeah. if you took, brought someone else who's a 10 in that area, now all of a sudden those two together, like it, it just, you have a significantly bigger impact when you just ignore the <laughs> the weakness and bring someone in who has the strength who's already put in you know because we mentioned earlier putting in the 10,000 hours or the 20,000 hours it takes to become fantastic at something um it you can compress time significantly by bringing someone else in by bringing you know filling in your weak gaps with people who are already strong and who've already put the time in to become masters 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah absolutely so if you have a huge glaring weakness in your in your team go get the best person you possibly can that person has 20 30 thousand hours of of, of of honing that skill and you could try to chase that down yourself for invest another 20 30 thousand hours and hope to become as proficient as they are yeah, absolutely. So I want to talk a little bit about your common enemy. And I think this will be a really fascinating discussion because of the space you're in. But every superhero has an arch nemesis, right? It's a thing that they constantly have to fight against in their world, right? In the world of business, it takes a lot of forms. But generally, we talk in terms of your clients, right? Um, so in this case, probably the startups that you are working with or the investors. Maybe you think consider both of them clients in various ways. Um, but it's a it's a mindset or it's a flaw that they have that you have to fight against all the time, right? So if you had your magic wand and you brought in a new client, you could just bop them on the head and not have to deal with that anymore. So you could actually get them the results that you promised. What is that common enemy that you regularly have to fight against in your world? Trend chasing. Trend chasing. So, trend chasing. Basically, because we're all in a position today where we can innovate, and where we want to push the boundaries further and further and further in this innovation. And obviously, I fully embrace innovation. But I only embrace innovation when the intent is to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. What I call trend chasing is this ever-growing number of startups and ideapreneurs, as I call them, that create the problem that they ultimately intend to solve. As a result of the democratization, which we covered earlier of the process of actually creating a business today, many businesses are being created that should not exist in the first place. There's just no product market fit, right? They don't really address a need in the marketplace and they don't really intend to solve a problem. So usually what it's done, it is obviously innocuous, but it usually comes by, by way of uh, young entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs that have a core passion in a specific field. And they just want to turn that passion into business. Nothing wrong with that. But sometimes that just does not work, right? Uh, what I usually say is, look, if you believe that your idea, no matter how far-fetched, and I'm not throwing any ideas out by definition, right? But prove this to yourself first. Show early validation. So let's say you're setting out to create a product or service. Instead of going down the route of actually doing it, investing a tremendous amount of money and resources and actually building it, and then trying to realize there is no ready market for it, conceptualize that product, that service first, communicate it properly, and try to get some early clients, first movers that will buy maybe via down payment, deposit, pre-purchase that idea before you actually go down the route of actually creating it. If you don't get buy-in at that ground level, you're not on the right track. Everything that we build internally, we iterate that way. We come up with the ideas, constant iteration, et cetera, et cetera. And then we say, we believe that this is a service we should create. Here's the reason why, you know, based upon customer feedback, we've realized we hear it all the time. They're really looking for a solution, addressing this problem, et cetera, et cetera. Then we basically put together a document. The document outlines the problem that we intend to solve via a new platform, via a new product, via a new service, and we pre-sell it to our clients. Yeah. If we don't have any buy-in, we abandon that idea. 
if the customers say, oh my God, if you can build this, I'm your client. And here, I'm willing to give you 10% today for making it happen. You know, you'd be surprised as to how few startups actually do that. Almost none. They all go in head first, sometimes on a questionable idea. And idea is obviously a dime a dozen today without any real validation uh, as to product market fit. Yeah, I, it actually makes me uh, feel good about uh, our my my newest agency that we've been uh, I've been building over the last couple of um, you know year and a half or so. The uh, the way that I built that agency was um, I had all of my existing clients in a spot, and one of the problems we were running into, I was like, hey, I I need to solve this problem for our clients, and I went to a couple of my clients, I was like, hey, I have an idea for a service that I think can solve this problem, um, and I was like, I have I want to build it, but I need. I need to be able to pay for labor costs and need to be able to pay for the other stuff to actually build it. Um, so I had a whole idea of like, here's how much I think it's going to cost and here's what I think we can do, do with it. And here's how, it, how it'll go. And I got, um, I got two or three clients to buy in and actually at it just break even for me where it was like, I could, I could just build the service with them um, and spent the next year building everything we needed to build and got all the feedback on where, where it worked and where it didn't and how we could fix it and how we could move it forward um, and, but they all, they all bought in and paid for the service monthly and really enjoyed what we were doing and got a lot of feedback for it and helped us grow our agency to where it is now. Um, there you so, go. That's exactly how it should be done. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, I feel good knowing someone like you who does this for a living is saying that's how it should be done. Cause I was just <laughs> going from the seat of my pants at that point. <laughs> that's a good seat of pants you got right there. Young man. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. Hopefully we'll be able to uh, continue to, uh, to grow that agency and do what, uh, do what I want to do with it. Um, so with the trans chasing, I'm curious, does it also get into the idea where I, I know it's really common to look at like, hey, you know, something is going and building here, right? You know, for instance, you mentioned um, the uh, uh, Uber and Lyft, right? Which is the whole sharing economy thing yeah. um, where people see that, trend and then everyone wants to jump on it and say hey i have an idea for this i have an idea for this and they're, they're just they're they're building on the idea of either you know just like uber and lyft we can use cars there's like you know rv share and yacht share and other things is it that kind of trend chasing that you're talking about is it is it is it different well see not necessarily because if you for example i know nothing about rvs i know you do but uh if if you have a real economy where you have a problem between supply and demand it makes perfect sense because actually you're looking to solve a problem by creating a platform that removes the friction right mm -hmm. uh what what i'm mostly uh alluding to are ideas for the sake of ideas and passions that don't necessarily should become a business yeah. uh, for, for a number of reasons, because the passion is not necessarily shared by, too, by many people, it's not scalable, or by the mere fact that the passion is not necessarily correlated to a problem. So no matter how passionate you are, if the problem doesn't exist, you cannot solve it. And to the extreme certain entrepreneurs take this is they tend to create that problem by chasing what they believe is a trend. What in fact you should be doing is what you just described a little bit earlier, rather than you know, taking a crystal ball and say, this is what I believe will happen in the future, try to focus on what's not changing. That's much more highly predictable, right? Yeah. It doesn't sound very smart to say that, but think about it, let it sink in. So tomorrow we're gonna wake up, we're gonna, take a shower. We're going to eat breakfast for most of us, unless you're intermittent fasting, like I am. You're going to, you're going to get closed. You, you, you're, going to, you're going to want to be entertained at some point during the day. Those are some core trends that us humans have been doing for hundreds of years that will not change tomorrow. Yet, in the provision of services and products within these areas, there's still a lot of friction, there's still a lot of problems to be solved. Amazon was the perfect example. Right. So back in the days or Netflix, you know, take Blockbuster for those of us who are old enough. I remember bringing a Blockbuster movie back late, significantly late and being charged forty eight dollars for bringing it back. Right. Well, that's a little that's a little insult. Right. Obviously, that make, make me feel too bad or, you know, too buddy buddy with uh, Blockbuster. So obviously, when Netflix came around, I jumped ship pretty quickly because I had no 
you know, brand recognition. There was no brand trust. The trust was broken as a result of that. So Netflix removed that friction altogether, initially by replicating and incrementally approving among Blockbuster's value proposition, because as we all know, prior to streaming, Netflix was shipping CDs. You send some back, we'll send you some more, et cetera, et cetera, and we'll never charge you a late fee again. That was the tagline, the initial tagline. The reason why that was the tagline is because that was the pain point that Blockbuster was inflicting upon everyone, right? So think about how many potential businesses we could still launch by focusing on what does not change today, where people just get frustrated. When you see people frustrated, for example, in a parking lot or at a parking meter, et cetera, et cetera, immediately my mind goes off. Well, maybe there is some friction there. Clearly, that's the reason why they get frustrated and and, and flustered. How could we possibly remove that? And then sometimes when you travel around, you see that problems that you have at home have already been solved somewhere else, right? And you have to realize, well, what would happen if I actually brought those solutions home? I've, now, it's, now it's more than visualization, right? I'm not predicting the future. I'm actually looking at something that's already been done elsewhere, but just not at home. So for example, Rocket Internet, the German internet giant, all they do is they follow the footsteps of major problem solvers like the Amazons of the world, like the Ubers, and they take it to developing countries like Africa. It's a very <laughs> successful model. They're copycats, yeah. right? So they're actually not visionaries. They're the opposite of visionary, right? They're taking somebody's, somebody else's vision. They're replicating in a different geographical area. And they're systematically execute the Germans, so they execute well, right? Yeah. And g- grabbing all the market share. Then you have all of the competitors uh, to Uber, Airbnb, et cetera, et cetera, in Nigeria and Kenya, et cetera, et cetera, Southeast Asia, you name it. Very successful yeah, model as well. I've always uh, um, my my boiling down for for people who want to get into business is is you find a group of people who have a problem and are willing to spend money to solve that problem, and then you develop a unique solution to help them solve that problem. And then your only thing that's left is figuring out how to get the messaging right so you can get that solution in front of those people. And I, would add, I would add one more thing. And it's an Albert Einstein quote. If you have a problem and you approach a politician with your problem to solve it, then you have two problems. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> so, so I want to talk about the flip side then of your common enemy, right? So the flip side, uh, you know, just like Spider-Man fights to save New York um, or Batman fights to save Gotham or Google fights to index and categorize all the world's information, you probably fight for something with your business, um, your mission, so to speak. What is, what is that? I would say the mission is one of inclusion, number one. And the mission is to democratize the process of allowing startup entrepreneurs to have impact. That's really what drives me most because I see so many younger and older entrepreneurs with great early stage business models, products or services that don't know how to bring them to market, for example, and, or they don't know how to set up a proper legal structure, a corporate structure. They don't know how to hire a team, right? But given the right set of tools and resources, they could have an immediate and measurable impact. Uh, here locally, I've seen some amazing stuff in the agri-tech space where like, oh my God, how can this not be done everywhere else? Like, how can you grow such a crop in such a, in, in such a small environment? And in one room, you have your fruits, your vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't even know that could be done, right? Of course yeah. it can be done. I've been doing it for 20, 30 years. I'm like, well, you get a communication problem. Right? How can we take this concept and teach the rest of the world how to properly do this? And the entrepreneur goes, I have no idea how. Maybe you can help me. Yeah. Right? So I think the key word would be empowerment. And the way we intend to empower these people, these idea, these entrepreneurs, is by giving them the right ecosystem in which to thrive and by putting at their disposal a full team that they would not know how to assemble themselves. So now you have any question, for example, if you have a great product or service and your logo sucks, you're not going to go very far because that's the first thing people see about you and they don't look beyond, unfortunately, right? Like, oh, that looks pretty amateurish. I'm probably not going to ingest that product, 
right? So, but most people don't realize that. Right, uh, even the people with the, with amazing products, uh, they don't realize the value of branding, the value of proper messaging, et cetera, et cetera. But again, give signals, hundred percent, hundred percent. But giving the right environment in which they could thrive, the light bulb goes off. We see this instantly. You bring people in, you bring, uh, you know, different people around the table with with uh, with other skill sets, designers, engineers, marketers, salespeople, et cetera, et cetera. They all throw their opinion into the hat and very quickly you see the you know the light the eyes light up of the entrepreneur oh my god i get it now so other, i see what i can thing, do the other thing that i think and i'm just like seeing this from as an outsider from talking about what you do is an entrepreneur they think well i i would be nice to have all those things but in order to have those things i have to have the money to hire them and that's where you bring the other side of that is the venture capital that yeah. you can bring the resources and the capital in order to afford those people to to get ideas off of the ground. The beauty is that, look, in order to have the same impact today as 25 years ago, you need 10, 20 times less capital. That's yeah. the bottom line, right? I'm talking specifically the tech industry, right? It's not applicable. If I were an infrastructure play in building bridges, it would be way, way different, right? It would probably be more expensive, but we're not. So, you know, as a result of this rapid demonetization of the process and democratization of the process, we can get bandwidth for a song today, uh, computer hardware, Moore's law, you know, doubles in processing power every 18 months, it's halved in price. You have all of these dynamics where, you know, it gets cheaper and cheaper and you become more and more efficient if you, again, have the right team, if you have the right environment, more so than the actual resources. The resources themselves are becoming less and less scarce as well. Uh, human resources probably are the most scarce still, but if you open up to the rest of the world via outsourcing, offshoring, some of the platforms where you can you know, identify talent. For example, on the Ochi example, the running app I was mentioning earlier, we just met two PhDs that actually have solved the algorithm already, uh, both on the running side and on the cycling side that we're bringing into the fold right now. And instead of developing this product for two or three years internally, we'll, we'll, we'll have a marketable product within the next two or three months. It's amazing, right? Because you can, you can access talent pools from all over the world. Yeah, and you can just, on some reverse procurement sites out there, say, look, this is our problem. Has anybody solved this before? Can anyone help? Yeah, yeah. And so that's where the driving force then is just figuring out how to how you can take the impact that you know these entrepreneurs can have if only they had the right tools and resources and pushing that out into the world. So you're you're speeding up the process of impact. Yeah, yeah. Don't let anybody tell you that it's not possible, right? It's hard to think outside the box if you let someone stick you inside a box, right? So forget about the boxes. You know, I don't know, for example, you know, France is somewhat rigid in that way too. The older generation I had a discussion with a lady about a year ago and uh, I was, and she is a, an elect uh, official. And I was explaining to her what it is that we were trying to build, the ecosystem, the unicorn ecosystem. And the lady told me after half an hour, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, sir, but you're never going to be able to do that here. And I'm saying, my answer was, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, ma'am. Since I knew you would say that, we just did it. It's we been done. Already. Everything I described to you has been done already. <laughs> That's awesome. So I want to talk um, a little bit about some practical things you use to grow your business, right? So one of the, the last things we talk about on the show here is um, the hero's tool belt, right? And just like every superhero has their, uh, their awesome gadgets like batarangs or... Uh, um, you know, the uh, laser eyes or the uh, web slingers, uh, entrepreneurs have tools, right? I want to talk, talk about the top one, maybe two tools you use in your business to do your day-to-day -day work, right? Could be anything from your notepad to your calendar, to your marketing tools, to something you use for product delivery, something, you know, you're like, we just couldn't do what we do today without this practical tool. So I, I, I use a number of them. I'm somewhat between a low-tech and a high-tech person, probably a mid-tech person. And uh, by saying that, what I mean is that I don't use technology for the sake of using technology. I use technology for the sake of making me more efficient. Uh, so for example, for anything that's CRM contact management, we use monday.com. 
which we've been using extensively for a while now. We still use Basecamp for general uh, project management and to keep everybody in the loop very efficiently. And then I use WhatsApp for web feverishly uh, throughout the day because it allows me to quickly create groups of people, share links, uh, share docs, et cetera, get instant feedback, measure the feedback and incorporate that. I think in terms of overall productivity hack, for me personally, I'm not saying this is for everyone, but for me personally, in terms of managing my team, quickly dispatching tasks, looking for updates on certain projects, WhatsApp for web and WhatsApp on mobile as well. But when I'm on my PC, it's probably the biggest productivity hack I've used in a, in a, in a long time. Then I've also slowly started uh, moving away from Zoom, not because of the issues that the media is talking about, but purely efficiency, because the five to 10 seconds it takes to load, G Meets pops right in my face. I have it right instant. I can grab a quick link faster. I can share it with WhatsApp on WhatsApp as well. And instead of waiting for two or three minutes for everybody to connect, be connected in 10 seconds, everybody's online. So those are some of the hacks I use on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of tools. I think the rest are just more mind hacks that I, that I use. Uh, I always ask myself one fundamental question before I go to sleep every night, and the answer to it is not always yes, is what have I achieved today and how much further did it get me along the process of where I want to be or who I want to become? Yeah. What it does is it programs my mind to refuse going to bed without having made progress. And I'm setting up my mind via this hack, very simple hack to say, look, if I fail today, if I've actually even taken a step back, which happens sometimes, I will know that tomorrow I'm going to make up for that. And by tomorrow night, I'll go to bed and say, okay, I've made at least 1% progress. I'm, I'm on the right path. Because I think... What creates depression in people, disappointment, whatever you may call it, is lack of progress, no matter what field you're in, where you think you're stagnating. It's a very uncomfortable feeling that creates friction. You can actually feel it physically. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the easier ways I've found to break out. I also, I'm a person that performs at a much higher level if I have lists, right? So I do have, I don't make the lists too long. And I also categorize the lists in terms of importance. Uh, if you read the seven habits of highly successful people, first things first, Stephen Covey books, I think those are great books in terms of making you a more efficient person, uh, especially the four quadrants where you basically have the core difference between important. the urgent items and the important items. And most, most people believe they're one and the same thing, but they're clearly not. Uh, tend to focus most of your energy, most of your time, on what's important versus urgent, right? Uh, an, an, urgency, an urgency is an emergency. Uh, it's really not an urgency. Uh, too many people spend too little time on what's really important, on what their ultimate goals are in life and on and accomplishing those goals. And they're distracted by these little urgencies slash emergencies. So yeah. those, those are some core rules I, I live by seven days a week. I like the uh, um, knowing your progress, right? Because I know that's one of the things that I always focus on in my life is, is I don't, I don't have to make a lot of progress every day, right? I don't have to like complete half of a project or complete a big portion project. It's just, I need to take the next step, right? Whatever the next step is. And as long as I take the next step every day, I'm always moving forward on it, right? Sometimes it's as, yeah. little, as easy as like today, I just need to write the headline for the next article. There you go. <laughs> right? I, 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 I accomplished that. We're moving forward. Unless you measure, unless you know where you are, it's difficult to know where you're going. Yeah, absolutely. Right? In order to know where you're going, you got to know where you are. That's your baseline. No matter how low that baseline is, right? So uh, today is the first day of the rest of your life, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the bottom line. So and that that is your baseline. You know, the baseline can be low, could be high, could be intermediate. But again, you know, yeah, it's up it's to you to like grow. It's like that snowball we talked about earlier where things grow, right? If you can stack a bunch of little progress together, those, that's not, it's not a linear growth pattern. Um, 100%. Yeah. You know, one, so one, one great, uh, you know, you can look up James Clear. You probably know him already. James Clear, 
and just type in Google, uh, Google or YouTube, James Clear Habits. Uh, he's probably the number one habit, habit hacker in the world. Uh, and he has the 1% rule of growing 1% every single day, incremental, incremental rules. So that one of the examples that he uses is the uh, British Olympic cycling team, which prior to 1996 had never won a single medal, uh, never won a single Tour de France or anything. And then they had a new coach who instilled those habits in them, the 1% per day progress. And they won every, 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 every race ever since pretty close to that. <laughs> That's amazing. It's a powerful principle for sure. Um, and I know it's helped me hit a lot of my goals. So um, I definitely like that. Speaking of heroic tools, I want to take a few minutes to tell you about a tool we built that powers the hero show and is now this show's primary sponsor. Hey there, fellow podcaster. Having a weekly audio and video show on all the major online networks that builds your brand, creates fame, and drives sales for your business doesn't have to be hard. I know it feels that way because you've tried managing your show internally and realize how resource intensive it can be. You felt the pain of pouring eight to 10 hours of work into just getting one hour of content published and promoted all over the place. You see the drain on your resources, but you do it anyways because you know how powerful it is. Heck, you've probably even tried some of those automated solutions and ended up with stuff that makes your brand look cheesy and cheap. That's not helping grow your business. Don't give up though. The struggle ends now. Introducing Push Button Podcasts, a done-for-you service that will help you get your show out every single week without you lifting a finger after you've pushed that stop record button. We handle everything else, uploading, editing, transcribing, writing, research, graphics, publication, and promotion, all done by real humans who know, understand, and care about your brand almost as much as you do. Empowered by our own proprietary technology, our team will let you get back to doing what you love while we handle the rest. Check us out at pushbuttonpodcast.com forward slash hero for 10% off the lifetime of your service with us and see the power of having an audio and video podcast growing and driving micro celebrity status and business in your niche without you having to lift more than a finger to push that stop record button. Again, that's pushbuttonpodcast.com forward slash hero. See you there. You're listening to The Hero Show, unlocking the power of influence and success. So speaking of principles, um, one of the things that makes heroes heroic is that they live by a code, right? For example, you know, Batman never kills his enemies. He only ever puts them in Arkham Asylum. So as we uh, wrap up this interview, I want to talk about the top one or two principles that you live your life by, right? Uh, maybe a principle you wish you knew when you first started out on your own hero's journey all those years ago. I think first one is probably constant progress. I'm looking, this is a marathon, this is not a race, although a marathon can be a race. Uh, I'm looking at continuously growing on every single level as a person. Uh, the other thing is, I would say perpetual education, which is so paramount in today's world because the, I think the most important skill and magic tool, not even a tool, skill set that you could probably build is the adaptability to and flexibility to change. Because yeah. the world around us is moving so fast and everything you've come to know as a reality, as a truth is quickly changing. So you have to at least open yourself to that fact first and foremost and be flexible. And be become flexible if you if you're not. Otherwise, you're going to be left behind. Right? The capacity to change is probably the number one predictor of your success in the in the future. Right? Yeah. Uh, technology is disrupting everything, as we know. Uh, technology will eventually disrupt the human race to a certain extent, as least at least the way we know this human race today. Uh, and that's why I'm also a strong believer in the merger of biology and technology. If we don't embrace that merger, which is imminent, we will be left behind as humankind. Some people talk about runaway AI as a major issue, a dangerous issue. I look at it differently because I believe that uh, fortunately AI initially was and still is developed by humans. I'm also an eternal optimist. Uh, and I believe that we will merge with technology and hence AI will not run away because we can't run away from ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where it's always tied to us in some form or fashion, it's not, not become a separate entity. Correct. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I know, like, <laughs> one of the things I joke about is, uh, you know, I, AI can't possibly ever take off and run off, a, run off on its own because all you have to do is just go in and put a, a blank return at the end of the line of code and it'll shut down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because like i know if you've ever done any software development stuff if like the line endings are wrong and right and those things are invisible the whole thing will just stop working and i'm like i'm not really worried about ai at this point <laughs> or it may, it may it may decide to self terminate too if it, if it if yeah. it finds itself too dangerous yeah yeah so it just i don't know we we put a lot of uh, human emotion into our fear of ai um that i don't think is well founded that's so, true yeah so that that is a uh, definitely interesting. So that is, um, it's been really fascinating chatting with you, Dom. I do have um, so that's basically a rapid interview. I do have one last thing I do at the end of all of my interviews that I call the Heroes Challenge, um, and I do this really to help get access to stories I might not otherwise find on my own because these people may not be looking to do the podcast rounds. So the question is simple: Do you have someone in your life or in your network that you think has a cool entrepreneurial story? Who are they? First names are fine. And why do you think they should come share their story with our audience here on The Hero Show? First person that comes to mind for you. Uh, first person that comes to mind would probably be a gentleman by the name of Arndt Schweiger, who is a German gentleman who is an AI scientist by trade and who has figured out a way of radically disrupt business planning and financial planning via a company called Hellmetrics. So uh, I think you'd find him absolutely fascinating. Uh, he's certainly one of the premier out of the box thinkers, which is what allowed him to actually build what he has built because his product is officially on the market. He's not planning on disrupting this industry. He's actually actively disrupting it. And he has some large clients that are starting, starting to buy into it. But I think in terms of uh, being able to do business planning, financial modeling, et cetera, et cetera, uh, any C CFA, and I've thrown a couple of CFAs at that, they're just like saying, wow, we thought we would have longevity in the field of uh, disruption. Uh, our days are numbered. Yeah. So Arndt Schweiger is, 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 is definitely one of those individuals. That's cool. Yeah, we'll reach out after the show and see if we can get him invited on. Maybe he'll say yes. We'll get to talk about his story a little bit. Um, but for this interview, right, in comic books, there's always the crowd of people at the end who are standing and cheering, clapping for the acts of heroism. So as we close, our analogous to that is where can people find you? Where can they light up the bat signal, so to speak, and say, hey, Dom, we've got a new um, startup thing. And we would need your help. Where can they go to get your help? And I think more importantly than where is who are the right types of people to raise their hands and reach out and light up the bat signal? Okay, let me start with the second question first. I think if you have a product or service in the technology space that is at or beyond proof of concept, you can knock on our door, right? Uh, if you need help scaling it, you can knock on our door. Uh, at least an inkling of a proof of concept show that you actually have a product that's either on the market has been adopted, if it's a B2B space by a handful of clients, if it's B2C, let's say it's a mobile app, you have 100, 500, 1,000 downloads that you've been able to generate on your own. Website is the easiest way, unicorninkubator.com. That's unicorn with a Q. My email is dom, D-O-M, at unicorninkubator.com. I'm also easily found on LinkedIn. I have an unusual name, first and last. The last name actually means unicorn in German. Dom Einhorn on LinkedIn is the easiest way. Last name is spelled E-I-N-H-O-R-N. -N. Awesome. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story, Dom, and getting into some of the topics we got to talk about today. It was in incredibly fascinating. Um, so again, thank you for showing that. And if you are in that space, if you are have a tech startup uh, that's beyond that proof of concept, definitely take the time to reach out to Dom. Obviously, just hearing his story and hearing how he's put together his team, he could probably help you with that. So thank you very much, Dom, for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me, Richard. It was a pleasure.